Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and just about anybody else looking to make great craft drinks. I'm a bar consultant with more than 10 years of industry experience. And I run abarabove.com, bringing weekly articles and cocktail recipes to help you make great drinks and grow your career behind the bar. This is episode number 96, and this week we're sharing a conversation that Chris had recently with Kayla Ellis, a seasoned bartender from Tennessee who's here to talk about her recent experience competing in the Woodford Reserve Manhattan Experience Competition. She has some great lessons learned and insights to share with any bartenders out there who are thinking of competing in cocktail competitions. By the way, this podcast episode is sponsored by Q Drinks, a craft mixer company based out of New York. We're seeing a lot of great new craft mixers coming on the market recently, and I've been really impressed with the quality, carbonation level, and flavor profile of Q Drinks tonic grapefruit and ginger beer mixers, along with the rest of their portfolio. They're made with real, carefully chosen ingredients and designed to let you create a complete balanced cocktail with just their mixer and your spirit of choice. So thanks again to Q Drinks for supporting this podcast. Excellent. Well, uh, we have a special guest on our podcast today. Kayla is going to be joining us and talking about some of her experiences with a cocktail competition she was in recently. So uh, thank you for joining us, Kayla. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so for having me. Yeah. And if you don't mind, just kind of giving a quick in- introduction of kind of who you are and uh, where you work and wh- most importantly, where people can grab cocktails from you. Yeah, definitely. I'm Kayla Ellis. I'm the head bartender over at Gray's on Main. I'm at in uh, downtown Franklin, Tennessee. We're, you know, 30, 40 minutes from Nashville. So it's a really great place to stop in. And we've got a lot of history here. So there's a lot to see when you come down here. Fantastic. Great. And we mentioned this earlier. We had a brief conversation before um, we started recording on the podcast. But now I'm really excited to go out there and have a cocktail with you. Yeah, you've got to. You've got to come in, everybody. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, we were um, chatting a little bit about cocktail competitions and some of the experiences that I've had in the past. And it seems like to me, like this is... There have been cocktail competitions for as long as I can remember, but they're kind of taken to the next level, and there's a lot more of them now um, over the last couple of years. I mean, you're seeing them all over the place from Diageo World Class. I know Bacardi has their own one. And which one did you compete in? So I did the Woodford Reserve Manhattan Experience. Perfect. And so it sounds like it was very much a bourbon-focused competition, and you had to make a, a Manhattan? Yeah, so your Manhattan, they wanted a variation, kind of like your take on the Manhattan. So for my Manhattan, I called it the Fire and Spice. It was a little bit of an inspiration for Robert Frost. And um, I used Ancho Reyes, which is a liqueur made from chili peppers. So I had a little spicy kick to it. And then Chinar, which is an artichoke liqueur, just to kind of mellow it out a touch. And then also Carpano Antica, which is, in my opinion, probably the best vermouth that money can buy. It's just a great sweet vermouth. And then I I made my own bitters for it. I made some Ancho Chili bitters and used Woodford Spiced Cherry bitters as well. Oh, nice. And how was the uh, process of making bitters for you? Because I've had some successes and challenges with it in the past. Yeah, I, I love making bitters. That's kind of one of the things that we excel at at Grace. We love really taking, just honing in on different flavors. And bitters are just the exact way that you can take control over a drink and really offer a lot and just a really concentrated you know, drop. So I, I wanted to kind of bring out that Ancho Reyes and that you know, it was kind of taking this other tone in the drink and I wanted to bring it out to another level. So just a, a couple drops of these bitters did the job. Nice. And did you use, what was the base of your bitters? So I used Laird's apple brandy, the hundred proof. I also used a little bit of, of vodka just because that's a money saver. Vodka is just the, a bit grain spirit to kind of jump and accelerate the bitters transaction. But I wanted the Lairds to kind of stand out as well because I wanted to give some shape to how the bitters were going to taste. Man, that sounds good already. I mean, the idea of kind of reinforcing it with a little bit of a neutral grain, that sounds awesome. It was tasty. I'm, I'm happy with how it came out. Excellent. Now, uh, was there any other cocktails I needed to develop for the competition or was it just the 
one cocktail. That's kind of the namesake of the competition. But the second cocktail they want you to do is an original. So I call that one the Grey Ghost. And um, the story there is it's, it's actually a Woodford Double Oak base spirit. That was part of the requirements. So the story was that in the Kentucky Derby, there was a horse that goes by the name the Gray Ghost. And he's. they say that his DNA continues to haunt the races today. And he brags a 22-win career, I think, with just one loss. And then I work at Gray's on Main. So my whole storyline was that what brought these two Gray Ghosts together, and that was Woodford. Gray's on Main, where I work, we are rumored to have many ghosts <laughs> haunt our halls. So uh, that's kind of the fun of it. So the storyline was good, but I, I think with both cocktails, my mistake and, and maybe the, the reason why, and I, I know the reason why I didn't go any further is because I went a little too handcrafted. So with this gray ghost, I made my own bitters. Once again, I made a cardamom bitter with a uh, cinchona bark and orange peel and a couple of other awesome yumminess going on. And then I also did Laird's Applejack this time. So it's a lower proof than the Laird's Apple Brandy. And uh, Bravo Amaro number no. one, which is a, an Amaro made by bartenders. And then just a little bit of an almond demerara that I used almond extract and then demerara to really bring up the viscosity and the richness of the cocktail. Wow, that sounds really good. Like super complex too. Yeah, I, I was hope uh, really what I was hoping for when I was shooting for the competition when I put my entry in is I just wanted to throw everything I could at the competition. I even made my own incense to smoke the glassware over. I know, right? It's a lot. It's a lot to throw out there. It sounds like that Andy uh, Sandberg essence comedy sketch you're just like throwing everything at the page but I wanted to get in and so I thought that was the way to do it you know just put everything you know how to do put it on paper and I, I think that you know that helps you get into the competition but if you want to make it you've got to really become a commercial for whatever brand is running that competition interesting yeah no that's something um, that I've had a couple of competitions myself and something that I always kind of struggled with because I, I really enjoyed the same thing is like creating those little touches that really kind of accentuate the cocktail. And um, I think at the end of the day, the focus of the brand is to make really easy replicate I can't even say the word easy to replicate cocktails uh yeah, you know for the replicable. average bar Absolutely. yeah so I, was, I, I always kind of struggle with that just kind of making it really good but making a um ingredients really simple um I think that's it's its own kind of hard uh, balance really it really it's it's difficult for me I'm, I mean I, I love cocktails I love getting into it I think I, I mean I understand now I think that um, I want to win so I, I feel like now that I've had this experience I talked with Jonathan Howard who was last year's winner and he's also from Nashville so I think the competition was pretty hefty out here in the Nashville area anyway because he had won last year and so when he came and looked at our cocktails when when the judges came through it kind of felt like they knew off the bat who was going to go and who wasn't just based off of our recipes. And so that could be a little disheartening because you're thinking, oh, man, like, like they're not really even tasting my drink here. But um, they still gave us, you know, a, a good appropriate amount of time. And I felt like they still cared. But it, afterwards is really when I gained the most knowledge because I went and talked to the judges and say, OK, you know, what can I do better? What I want to improve. So what can what do I need to change and, and improve upon for next year? And they gave, he gave me some great tips. Nice. Yeah. And I know that not everybody does that. Not every contestant stays afterwards and asks those hard questions. But I mean, that is where you get so much value. I mean, if you're competing and you didn't quite make the cut, it's some really, really valuable lessons for sure. Yeah, it was a great experience. I think, I think in every way I learned a lot, even our location in the room, it was drawn out of a hat. So we kind of were, you know, you're stuck where you're at. But um, if people, after the judges do their thing, then we had the guests come in as well, which we had, I think, around 180 guests who came in to the event. And it was cool. Everybody kind of came in. But if they followed kind of the shape of the room, they would have had to have had 18 shots before they got to my table if they really were taking a drink at every table. So that kind of played a role, too, I think. So with my incense going, it kind of was smoking into the room, and I think kind of pulled people to our table. Oh, nice. All right. Yeah. So it helped out a little bit. We didn't actually – one of my friends 
Zach Helton, he's also known as the Drink Whisperer. He works over at Cork and Cow, which is one of our neighboring, you know, kind of restaurants, bars that, I mean, we're, we're not really like sister restaurants, but when you work in the same town and you're such in this small city, ends up working out like that. So I consider him definitely one of the mentors in the game. And he won uh, People's Choice. So I was really proud of him. I think he did a great job. Nice. And for the actual event, it sounds like it, there was kind of a two-part scenario where the first part was judging. So the judges kind of walked the tables and sampled all the cocktails. And then the second part was the open to the public portion of it. Does that sound right? Exactly. That's exactly. And I really like Angie is the one who ran that this event this time. She did a great job. I really think that it makes so much more sense to have the judges come through first, kind of have a quiet time with the individuals. We had about 10 minutes to make six cocktails total. And I think it worked so much better this way. They've done it in the past, apparently, where they had the judges come after the people came through after they served all the guests. And so that's kind of just, you know, a mess trying to get everything together back to a position where it's, you know, you've got, I had a completely different setup that I used for my guests compared to what I use for the judges. So I can't imagine having to stop mid show and have to switch over to, to prep for the judges coming through. Yeah, that's got to be nerve wracking. Uh, I've actually had to do both sides as a competition and as a judge. And, you know, being able to have your own time to have a conversation with a judge without 25 people staring at you, waiting for that next round of drinks to come out. I could see how that could be a little bit uneasy and not like the best use of time. So that's a pretty cool setup, though. I, I like the the two part to that. And then was it after the judges left? Was it kind of complete mayhem or how did the, the rest of the event work out? Yeah, I think there was like a, a little space where it was like, oh, there's food in the back. Oh, there's people coming in. Like, oh, there's, there, you know, a, a little different. Where'd my bar back go? That kind of thing. But it came together really well. I pretty much stayed glued to the table, which I walked around a little bit beforehand and really got to, which is another reason why I liked the fact that they did the judging ahead of time is because there was kind of just this quiet time where all the bartenders could kind of check out what, what they had going on. And just do some, you know, bar talk with each other, which was fun to kind of get to know my peers. Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest things about these competitions is it's a really great way to surround yourself with like-minded bartenders that are really looking forward to, you know, moving forward in their careers. Kind of they take it, what they do very seriously and just finding out who's in your town and being able to just put a face to the name and, you know, start those conversations off. It's a great way to just network and kind of elevate your game too, really. Yeah, I completely agree. I keep thinking about, you know, what next competitions are, are things that I want to invest in because it does take a big toll. You know, you've got to make, a, it's a lot of money just to get the alcohol on the table. And then when you've got a lot of little things going on too, it can add up. Yeah, no, I remember a couple of the competitions I've done in the past and it is, it, it's not just create a cocktail and present it to the judge, there's a lot of like process behind it. And you're really thinking out the delivery process of the drink. I know a lot of people actually invest in very specific pieces of hardware, uh, whether it be glassware or a mixing glass or, you know, a whole, you know, a table presentation, essentially. And that that can definitely add up over very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's kind of what I ran into. My, our, bosses, my boss, my owner over at Grays on Main, his name is Michael Cole and his wife is Joni Cole and they, they ended up funding all of the alcohol for the event. But I also I didn't want to have them pay for all of the extra things that I was doing, like the the incense and the you know, I, I went and found my own slab of oak and then char hand charred it. So I, I didn't want them to pay for all those little pieces that were adding up. So I kind of had to budget that myself. And he, he may have, but he, I know that he was willing to have covered that. But knowing that, you know, I may or may not win, I didn't really want to just add a bunch of extra things to his bill. And it was, he was really kind to help with the alcohol. That's great. All that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, it sounds like he's investing in his people and making sure they have what they need to do a really great job if they if they wanted to compete and stuff. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I love that. Our, our owners are great. And I think that they really understand what they're investing in and that there's a bigger picture there. 
So it, it's pretty cool to see it all come together. And next year I'm going to win. So <laughs> nice, yeah. Oh, I've worked at a couple of places where it could go either way. Like there's no investment in the bar program, so it's bartenders, you know, scraping together resources to buy bitters. And you know, if you want a mixing glass, you buy your own and you bring it in, and your bar tools are your own. So the fact that they're willing to kind of you know give you essentially like a budget to do things like competitions outside of work, that's amazing. That's really great. Yeah, it's been it's been really great. I really love working with this bar program. We're all pre-prohibition. So all of the things that we do, it's all about the details and it's cool to see it all come together. Nice. So with that being said, what are some of the main takeaways, uh, some of the lessons learned, some mistakes that you think maybe you've made in the competition that you can probably you know, pass on to uh, anybody that's thinking about getting into the competitions? Well, there were some little things that I, I think just really, when I put it all together, how I can clean up my entire presentation. I have a, um, a bad tremble with my hands at different times. And um, it usually stems from some kind of like, you know, I didn't eat enough that day or I didn't get enough iron or something like that. Now, sometimes I can hide it really well and other times I, I can't. And so my nerves didn't help either on top of that. And I asked uh, Jonathan Howard about it after the fact. And he said a good trick is to kind of steady the backside of your hand against the glass and then as you pour, then turn into the glass. And he says it looks like just really good technique, and, and it is. But really, it's steadying your hand and, and making sure you're getting a really level pour. He did say that my, you know, he didn't really see my hands trembling very much, but it was just a really good tip, and I was, I was grateful for it. So that was, that was one that he gave me. Another one is that we definitely over-prepared as much as possible, and that paid off big time. We had extra ice on the side, KD ice that we brought in, because their ice was like the small chipped ice, and t it kind of had a weird aftertaste. So um, I was really glad that we brought a whole cooler full of ice. I actually shipped in limestone water from Kentucky to make my ice spheres with. What? I know, it's just another level of like, so intense. Yeah, that's great. But it, it worked out great, and I made six spheres from this water, only needing three. And I was so glad that I made the extra three because it came out perfectly that I had three spheres that worked and three spheres that didn't. So doing that extra, making those backup spheres was really a great thing. But then I also, when I didn't know if my spheres were going to make it, I was able to call an Uber for some extra spheres. I had my work Uber over uh, maybe six extra spheres just so we could have some extra ice spheres on hand. That's amazing. That's very resourceful. <laughs> just doing whatever you can, I think, is, you know, the, at the end of it all, is like do as much as you can, as early as you can. And then if you have something extra, oh, well, you've got it extra on hand. But I really was grateful to have like all of these little, you know, extra pieces available to me. And I think maybe the last thing that I was really grateful for was my bar back. My bar back is Griffin Horn. He did a great job. He really kind of uh, was there to help. He, he kind of wanted to do more than he even really could. So next year, what I plan on doing with him or with any bar back is uh, prepping them a little bit more in the concept of the drink so that I can step away a little bit more. I don't need him to really, you know, you, you kind of want your bar back to do that, that, you know, nice closed mouth kind of cleaning, ready to go job. But at the same time, you don't want them to be unavailable when a guest comes up and asks them a question. So I think that what we can do a little bit more trying to prep to make sure that he can answer questions if I'm unavailable, if I'm already talking to another guest, he can take care of that. And then when he, uh, there, there was one, at one point he was trying to fill the ice up for me while we had our five minute mark. He was filling up my stirring glasses and one of them toppled over and he, I could tell he was just like devastated because it was right in front of the judges. And, but I know that at the end of the day, they're looking at me and how I handle the situation. So I just, in that moment was just like, Oh, it's okay, hon. You know, I pulled that Southern hospitality out. It's okay, hon. It's all right there. And I uh, just pushed the ice to the side, reloaded it. And I could see that the judges appreciated that you just kind of take it in stride. I mean, in the moment, my head is, was going, well, thanks for coming by judges. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but at the same time, I knew that you, if I blew up or if I took it to an extreme and rather than just kind of keeping the flow going, then that would have definitely hurt me. In the end, I think it helped more than anything. 
just that they saw that I could kind of keep the flow going regardless of the situation and just kind of adapt. Right. And I mean, that's kind of what we do on a day-to-day basis behind the bar. I mean, we have challenges all the time, you know, whether it be a group of 10 people walk up to the bar right behind, a you know, another group. And we just got to take that stuff in stride. And, you know, with especially with competitions, something that you mentioned we may have talked about earlier is it's not always about winning the competition. A lot of what happens inside of a competition is trying to figure out who's in the industry around you and kind of earmarking people for, oh, you know what, let's keep an eye on this person for career development in the future because if something ever, you know, opens up, how they handle yourself under pressure is going to be how you handle in front of other people. So, for example, like a brand ambassador for Woodford, you know, those people were probably in that room or having conversations like, okay, this person could potentially be somebody to keep an eye on. And the fact that you held yourself really composed and showed grace under fire, I'm sure did not go unnoticed. I think you're totally right. There's a lot of people, they specifically seek out people who are in the trade to come to these events. And so there's a lot of networking that happens, you know, in addition to the bartenders that I'm meeting, the guests that come in too, aren't just necessarily people off the street. They're also people who might be the next person to give you a job, whether it's, you know, a year from now or 10 years from now. So it was, it was just a great experience in every way. I ended up feeling pretty good about where we landed. We don't get any accolades for this, but we were kind of second in line for the people's choice. Oh, nice. All right. Yeah, that was, it was great. But I mean, that doesn't get mentioned, you know, that's not really a, there's no plaque for that, but I do feel really good about that. I feel like I, we learned everything that we needed to learn. And if my biggest fault was that I did so much that I didn't win, then that's not too bad. I can leave that room and and feel like I put everything I could on the table. And now I've learned what I need to learn to do better next year. Yeah. And when I first started competing and uh, entering a couple of the competitions, I was completely unprepared. I had no idea what I was walking into. And I made some pretty serious errors in the beginning. I think I may have mentioned this to you in an email we had earlier is one of my competitions, I actually finished the cocktail hours before the actual competition, not because I was putting it off, but just because I was fine tuning a couple things here, a couple things there. And I, I should have just let it go and said, no, I'm good. Uh, it's going to, it's as good as it ever will be. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, you're just not emotionally prepared for a competition when you're so stressed out for finishing the cocktail. So that was one of the things that I learned very quickly is just do it early, prep as much as you possibly can in the beginning, and then just prepare yourself emotionally on, you know, how you're going to present the cocktail, what's the story behind the cocktail, because they're going to be asking you, and they're typically going to be a bunch of people looking at you while you're saying, you know, telling a story and possibly even tending bar at the same time. So the tighter you can get all that presentation, the more confident you're going to look, the more casual and the more prepared you're going to look. So, and those were a couple of my big takeaways from uh, when I was first competing. And a couple other ones were, you mentioned it just a couple of minutes ago, is you never know who's going to give you a job down the line. And that actually happened to me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So we had a big competition out here. It wasn't really a competition. It was more of a USBG a uh, roll call for cocktails. They paired you with a brand and you were, your job was to create a cocktail to showcase their, their brand. So the one I was paired with was Patron. And even now, bartenders have mixed feelings for the product Patron uh, and the company. I have a lot of respect for them and I always have. So I, it wasn't a bad pairing for me. But I created a couple cocktails. I gave business cards to the people I was working with because the coordinator for Patron was there and a couple of the people on the supplier side. We have Southern Wine and Spirits. I don't know if that's the same company you guys have out there southern glaciers i think they are now but yeah i gave my card to them and you know just kind of network and say hey you know this i love doing this if you ever have any special events or private events uh, you're looking for creative bartenders uh, just give me a heads up and you know i made sure to give them exchange business cards and i followed up with them you know a couple days afterwards just being gracious and saying thank you so much i feel very honored to represent your brand and i appreciate it keep me in mind and all that stuff and they actually did so i did a couple private event for Patron down the road. And then we actually, they actually reached out to me when they launched the Roca 
line. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And me and a couple other bartenders from uh, San Francisco helped launch in the North Bay here. But, you know, it's all these things really matter, especially if you're looking to be a career bartender and, you know, go to the next levels. The work you put in now can really pay off down the road, especially if you keep that graciousness about you and, you know, you don't yell at your bar back when he breaks mixing glasses in front of judges and stuff. You know, it really does um, pay off and people definitely keep that in mind down the road. But yeah, no, it sounds like you had a great experience. Yeah, it was just so much fun. I, I can't wait to try again. Woodford is definitely a, a spirit that we love over, over at Gray's. We happen to be a brandy bar. We're actually the first brandy bar in the South and we're the second in the nation. But that doesn't mean that we don't love our whiskeys and bourbons, basically, because if we're, we're a pre-prohibition bar, we're really leaning towards brandy. But whiskey has such a prominent role within the American histories, within America's growth. So it, it's cool to see Woodford's role in that. And it's such, it, it was such a tasty spirit to work with that really I, I just had a good time. You know, if it was another spirit or if it was something that maybe like I didn't respect as much, then, you know, it wouldn't have been nearly as fun. But Woodford's just great all around. They have a really quality product. So, yeah, I think everyone had a good time. It was just everyone felt good about what they were doing. This is a competition that this is our second year at Gray's to be participating in. Last year, Micah Bram was was participating. And this year, we actually had two bartenders from our bar representing and we were the only bar there that had two bartenders representing in that competition. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was just on every level. It was like I felt really proud of of what we brought to the table, both uh, personally what I brought and what our bar came in with. So, so yeah, it was just great all around. Perfect. And um, just I, I have to ask this question, but can people actually get your cocktail competition or your – competition cocktails on the menu right now at Grace? It's in the works. So we usually do a twice a year, we, we do a seasonal menu. I did a little bit right after the competition. I did a series called the Taste My Defeat series. Oh, no, I love the name. That's so great. Yeah, it was fun. And I, I said Taste My Defeat because basically this is your only chance to do it next year. I'm going to win. That's how I feel. Oh, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> so I ran my cocktails that we had and then with a little bit of variation, you know, switching it up for a more realistic serving up, just a little bit different. And then Trevor Wheeler with the other individual who made it into the competition alongside me, he ran his two cocktails as well once mine ran out. And and so we just kind of had a short little series there. But as soon as we switch up the menu, we're going to talk about getting on new, new drinks onto the menu. So that should be in the works. Very cool. Excellent. And then uh, as far as next competitions or any other competitions you're really hoping to get into this year? Anything uh, kind of coming up on your radar? I don't know. I, I love that. The bartender of the year. <laughs> That's always something I'm looking at. Shivas always has a good one. Good people running. Those are. I, I'm always leaning those those kind of directions. So, but really, I'll come whatever whatever t- comes my way. I, I'm gonna see if I can handle it, and if it's something I can do, I'm gonna take it on. Well, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us and uh, taking the time out to share some of your takeaways from competing. Definitely appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, and, and say hi to Julia for me. Definitely. Thanks, Kayla. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again to Kayla for taking the time to meet with Chris and share your experience. The thing that I always love about Kayla is her positive attitude. While many people might get frustrated when they don't win, Kayla took it as an opportunity to grow and learn instead. It's so refreshing and powerful to see that mindset in our industry. If you take every setback as an opportunity to learn and grow, I don't know if there's anything that can hold you back from your career goals. We have photos and recipes of her cocktails over in the show notes at mixologytalk.com slash 96. We also have a link to find her on Instagram, and we have a link to our cocktail competitions page, which has links for a bunch of other cocktail competitions that are open for entry right now. So if you're feeling inspired, that would definitely be the place to go. Thanks again to Kayla and Chris for the great interview. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.